what influences your life. Whose voice do you listen to? What do you allow to define you? Too often we look to our job, our skills, our culture, our relationships. The list goes on and on. But none of these are our true identity. Do you know who you are? Good morning, my name is Craig Suglia, and I have the pleasure of serving in Hope College and Hope Kids. Um, please stand for today's reading. Our passage today is Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended it on a high level, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also had descended in the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ until we attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the ways and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking in the truth and love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the body, whole body, joined and held together by every joint which is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Craig. Good job. You may be seated. Good morning. morning. God, it's great to see you this morning. Uh, Today we're back in the book of Ephesians together. If you came through the doors, well, I guess you had to come through the doors to get in, right? Then you have some notes if you'd like to follow along as well this morning through the notes. I, I want to say as I start our teaching today that These 16 verses encompass such a large amount of amazing, I think, inspiration and information for you and I through Paul's writings that there is no way that I can cover all of this in the time frame that we have today. So I just want to tell you that if I kind of brush over some sections, well, maybe you go study those on your own and then reach out to someone for maybe further information on those as well, or or just reach out to one of us as a staff member. But I just wanted to share that up front. I can't cover everything in all of these 16 verses. I'm still looking for the guy or whoever that set all this up, right, and said I had to preach 16 verses. I mean, you know, he could be standing in front of you as well, but yet, you know, here we are, and so I'm excited about it this morning. So I want to talk to you about growing up into Christ, and those are the words that Paul uses in this portion of his letter to the church at Ephesus. Now, I've shared this with you so many times, you know, that I'm a father of three sons, and, and so through this thinking about that, that I've come to a conclusion, not the conclusion, but a conclusion, and that is that we have children for the purpose of loving them, yes. We have children for the purpose of shaping them, absolutely, but we also have children for the purpose of them growing up, you know? That is kind of the, the uh, goal in all of this is for them to grow up. And, and I love my kids when they were kids, 
but since they're grown, and well, I still love them, okay? I put that right. I still love them, but kind of that love has changed in some ways as well and intensified and it's greater as well. But yet now that I am a little older, a little older, then I say things to younger parents when I see them with children like, oh, cherish that time that you have with them because it will pass so quickly. I say that, perhaps I've said that to some of you in the room this morning as well, but I have forgotten things like sleep deprivation. I have forgotten those. I have forgotten things like getting up at three o'clock in the morning and changing the sheets when there has been an accident. I have forgotten what, you know, it smells like when you get to work and you've dropped your kids off and all of a sudden you smell spit up, you know, and you don't have a kid with you and you look down and realize that you have a big stain on your shirt. You know, you know what I mean, if you're, you have a child. You know, that I have forgotten what it's like to look in the back of the car and it looks like a rolling Chick-fil-A dumpster, okay, right? That I have forgotten some of those things. I have forgotten what it likes to wake up in the morning and there being a little human being in the bed with you and his feet is right in your face or even something worse is in your face, right? So I've forgotten those things. I kind of blocked out some of those memories for some reason. I don't know why, but, but I have. But what we want them to do is we want them to grow up and that doesn't mean that we don't love them. In fact, I think perhaps one of the greatest ways to love our children is to nurture them and to shape them so that they do grow up. Because there's really not a whole lot worse than that of a 13-year-old that acts like a 3-year-old. Can I get an amen? So you understand what I mean. So our goal is for them to grow up. And now, when they get older, they actually become more useful to you. They really do as they get older, right? Because when they get older, they can mow the lawn, and you don't have to mow the lawn anymore. They can take out the trash. They can walk the family pet. They can clean the Chick-fil-A debris from the back of the car as well, right? And because our goal is for them to grow up. You don't want them living in your basement at 35 years old and playing video games. This is true. Absolutely. Absolutely. So they have to grow up and sometimes take responsibility. So I thought, well, you know, ha, ha, this, is what, this is Ephesians chapter 4 is exactly what it is. And so it speaks to you and I in our spiritual growth, in our growth patterns with God, and it speaks to where we are in that process. Because what I realize for some of you, and let me take a moment to perhaps offend some of you this morning, Okay. And that is that some of you in the room today need to grow up spiritually, is what Paul is teaching us. Because for some of us, we still have one of these in our mouth spiritually. We do. And so what Paul is saying is it's time to grow up, and it's time for us to become useful to the body of Christ. And, and so I want to talk about that because that is really Paul's focus for us today. Now, I'm a visual person. You're looking up here at my table and you're wondering, what is all these things? Well, I have a lot of visual aids this morning because I just want to, you to grasp what Paul is teaching us this morning. So he says in Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 1, he says, Therefore, a prisoner of the Lord. Therefore, a prisoner of the Lord. And, and, and I want to say that this is the way he started out the text that we used last week as well. But remember, this is one letter, one complete work from God. And he says that he urges us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. So he starts with therefore. So I always say to you, what is therefore, therefore, right? Why is it there? Why does Paul start this out? Because he says, you need to understand what I've written before all of this that I'm about to say. You have to take into consideration the first three chapters of this book because that is the gospel. It is when he lays out the gospel to you and I so completely and so perfectly. 50% of this book, 50% of this book, this letter is a gospel conversation to the church at Ephesus. Why? Because if we miss the foundation of the gospel and try to move into the things that Paul is going to talk about in a moment, things like 
ministry gifts, and things like relationships and marriage and family and children, then we're going to try to attempt those things on our own and not see them to be a work of the Spirit within our lives. And so we're going to try to work all this through that of human initiative, and it doesn't work that way. So he brings us back to the gospel, reminds us of what he said to you and I last week, that the gospel, the mystery is that he has brought you and I together in all of our differences, that we remember last week, if you were here, that we're not bricks, that we're, we're not all symmetrically alike. And if we were, then it could be, and this could be, this morning, this room could very well be a work of human hands and human initiative because it fits together well. But in reality, you and I are like this. We have all of these different edges and different shapes, and yet God fits us together absolutely perfectly. We said the definition of what he calls the mystery is that of the church at Ephesus and how he put that of Jews and Gentiles together with all of their differences, all of their different shapes, and he meshed them together perfectly. He said, before you can understand all the other things I'm going to say to you, you have to understand how the gospel works in your life, and this is a work of the Spirit, is what he's saying. It's a divine and sovereign work of God for our lives to walk a walk that is worthy of of the calling that is worthy of the gospel. Can you feel the weight of that? Yeah. We talked about the gospel for so many weeks that most of you, if you've been here, you understand what it is and what Christ has done for you, freely given to you by his grace and his love. And now he says we are to walk worthy of that call. The calling is what he calls it. A call for you and I to live a certain way. You see, in chapter 4 is where we find that the book of Ephesians becomes extremely practical for you and I. It talks about how we live out what we have already experienced through the gospel, meaning that, that we live as a proper response to the gospel. We live as a proper response to the gospel. And, and if I don't, then I need to go back and read those first three chapters again as well and open my heart to what God is saying. Now, let me clarify something for you. When he's talking about walking worthy of the call, the gospel, he's not calling us to walk in a way that we earn the gospel. It's not about walking in a way that you and I cause God to love us more. That's not what he's saying at all. In fact, if that's what he was saying as Paul being the writer, then he would have to go back and erase a lot of the book of Romans and a lot of other of his epistles as well as he talks to us about how we are saved through grace alone and not by our works, at least we should boast. So that's not what he's saying at all. It's not that to make God love us more, but it's because he loves us. That we walk a life that is worthy of the calling because he loves us. It's motivated by gratitude. Understand that is what he's saying to you and I. Not, not to desire to earn merit or not even out of fear. That we carry ourselves according to what Christ has done. So what is our response to the gospel? That's the question. What is our response? response to the gospel. We live in a way worthy of the calling. And then I wrote this in my notes this week that if I get the gospel, if I have the understanding of these first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, then I'm more likely to respond properly through my actions. If I get what he is teaching me about the gospel of Christ and how it works and how you and I are knitted together so perfectly, even though we are so different, if I get all of that, then I'm more likely to respond properly through my actions. So let me say something to you. These next few verses will challenge us. Understand that. It will challenge us so don't embark on this journey through complete and total human initiative because what Paul is going to talk to us about is not accomplishable through that of just your own willpower. 
So he says, okay, let's get down to brass tacks now, you know, kind of deal. Let's talk about how you live this out. And here's what he says in verse 2. With all humility, I told you it's going to really talk to where we live. With all humility and with, all, and with gentleness and with patience, there's the word, the P word, right? With patience, bearing with one another in love, eager, I underlined that because that means that I am motivated to do this, eager to maintain, a important word, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So here's what he's going to talk to us about. Living out our response to the gospel. Living out our response to the gospel. And he says that this is the way I do this, that I do this in humility, By the word humility, write the word lowliness. I think it's even a better word there. Humility in gentleness. By the word gentleness, write the word meekness. By the word patience, write the word long-suffering. I like that because patience does involve suffering at times in our life. Does it not? Sure. Yes. That's why none of you are praying for patience, correct? Yes, because it is long-suffering. And then he says, bearing with one another in love. It doesn't mean just tolerating each other in the room, and that constitutes a proper picture of the body of Christ. It means that we are standing up holding one another, is what he's talking about, when bearing one another in love. That that is a worthy walk with God marked by these attributes. How do I do that? Well, then you have to understand the first three chapters because that kind of lifestyle cannot be fueled by just your good intentions. It can't. It has to be fueled by you having a really good understanding of the gospel because when I am focused on what God has done for me in my life, even though I deserve nothing that God has done for me, absolutely nothing, that that is the fuel that would give me the catalyst for that kind of lifestyle. The gospel is not a one-off event in your life. The gospel is not just that moment when God chooses you. You come to redemption, you walk the aisle, whatever you did to have that experience within your life, It's not that at all. Understand that. It is a moment-by-moment lifestyle for you and I. It is the fuel in which I run off of to be able to live a life in humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with you and you bearing with me in love. I have to have an understanding of the gospel. And he says that we're eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. They were eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another is how we keep that. Here is the thought. He uses the word maintain. So I looked up and I thought, well, maybe that's a word that could be substituted with something else. But it's not at all. So what it says to me is this, that I'm not the creator of the unity of this body. God is the creator of the unity, no matter how good I am, no matter how patient I am, no matter how long-suffering, no matter how gentle I am, that I am not the creator of the unity that you and I share as he meshes you and I together with all of our differences. I'm not. But what I do understand is I have a responsibility as a follower of Christ to maintain that unity. And there's a difference. Because if I am the creator, then it's a work of Mark. And so when I look at the church at Ephesus, I realize that that eclectic group of people, Jews and Gentiles, those coming from pagan backgrounds, those coming from religious backgrounds, they're, they're multicultural in so many ways in different languages and traditions and economics and politics and all of that. And listen, if that was a church that was to be maintained by human initiative, it would fail in the first five minutes. The first meeting would be a massive riot, and somebody would die because of all the differences in that church at Ephesus. So what I realize is this, 
that this is a unity that's born by the Spirit through the gospel in our lives that you and I are experiencing right now, but it's my place as a member of this body to maintain that unity through that of humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with you in love. That's important for you to understand. That that unity doesn't exist outside of a work of the gospel in our lives. So it's not about a a doctrinal or denominational or philosophical or, or ideological unity at all. No, this is the mystery that we talked about last week. This is the sovereign work of God. But I have a responsibility. We always say that we work And and Hope Fellowship is founded on this philosophy and this ideology of God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. So I do have a responsibility to a sovereign work of God within my life. And that is how I love you and how I treat you. Because if I don't get this right in this room with you, how will I ever get it right outside of this room? I won't. So this is a unity that's maintained in loving Christ, seeking to be like him in a greater way in my life, loving each other well before I try to love the world outside of this room. That's how we preserve unity. So I begin to think about church and unity and disunity a lot. Yes, and what I realize is this, that no church division As we call it, some of the modern day, I think, terms that we use, right, that our our sort of our religious way of evangelism, we call it splitting, right? So, you know, I don't know if you've ever been involved in a church split, as we call it. It's a tragic and horrible thing is what it is. But what I realize that no church division ever began with those who fully are in love with Christ and are devoted to each other. No, no church ever splits because of that, that they're fully in love with Christ and they're fully devoted to one another. That is not the way it works. And if you want to division-proof your church, then love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. But when we stop doing those kinds of things, That we give place to the devil, and when we give place to the devil, because the devil lacks any creativity, he is absolutely void of creativity, he always uses the same strategy against us. And what is the devil's main strategy? Division. Division. Because if he can divide us in here, then we self-destruct is what happens. And then the testimony that we give to the world who do not know Christ is not the testimony that we want to give. That's why Paul is talking about unity. And he's using for you and I this, this example of the church at Ephesus. Do you realize that the church at Ephesus does just, it doesn't just survive with everybody coming together with all their different backgrounds. It thrives. Do we realize that the church at Ephesus sets it a place geographically whether, where it's the doorway to Europe? In fact, the evangelization of Europe through Christianity was brought through the church at Ephesus. Do you know what that means for you and I? That means that you and I heard the gospel because of the church at Ephesus and their unity together as a body of Christ. That's powerful. But it wasn't a unity they built on, or they built, but it was a unity they maintained by living this kind of lifestyle, by walking worthy of the calling. So verse 4 says that there is one body and one spirit, that this is a sovereign work of God, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Unity through what you and I share in common, that we share one body. This is not a Jewish body or a Gentile body. It's not a black body or a white body. It is one body. We have learned through these first three chapters that we're not just the same old model of car with a new paint job. Remember that we are a new being in Christ. He has completely recreated us. He doesn't erase all of our differences, but yet, in fact, we find unity in the middle of the things that we find different with one another. But then he says, it's because of the work of one spirit that brings unity within our lives. One hope of our calling. What does that mean? That we all in this room, when Christ chose us, whether we were sweet as sugar before we come to Christ, or yet we were as evil as evil could be, we all were in need of a Savior and the work of the gospel in our life. Every one of us, no exception. One Lord, one baptism, and that is water baptism, is a sign of what Christ has done inwardly within our lives. One Father. This a beautiful model here that, that Paul gives of the Trinity and how it works in perfect unity is the model that he gives for you and I in the way that we conduct ourselves. See, I told you. You wouldn't listen, but now I told you. Now you understand, right? That you cannot do this just by mere human initiative. It doesn't work. That's why Paul has shown us this sovereign work of God and his spirit in the church in these first three chapters for you and I to understand that this is about you and I submitting ourselves to God and the Holy Spirit working in our lives so that we live this kind of lifestyle worthy of this call that he gives us. So I thought about how that I view this call and this unity. So I thought about, and I read this illustration about, about my hand, my physical hand, right? And, and what I realize is that I don't put my hand together. My hand comes together. It's a work of the creator of God as well, that through growing up, my mom never had to come and say to me that daily, that daily I should, I should you know, put my hand together. It doesn't work that way, right? Unless you're Frankenstein. It's sewn together, right? And if that's the case, Please show me that at the end of the service. I want to see that. I really do. But what I realize is this is something that naturally happens. But, and you're wondering what this is doing perhaps, right? But when I'm around this, right? And this could go really bad right in front of everybody. But what I realize is that when I'm, when I'm around this, what I understand is that I'm very careful and intentional to maintain the unity of my hand. True? Because I could easily lose it with this. I didn't create it, but I'm eager, as Paul uses this word, to maintain the unity of it. And so I thought about this. As a believer as one that confesses to be a Christ follower, then if I have experienced the gospel, then it is an organic response to my experience of the gospel to maintain unity through love and patience and humility and gentleness. That I'm eager to do that. I want to say this one more time because I think this has to sink in deep into our spirit that if I have experienced the gospel, listen, then I am eager, I am eager to maintain unity through love and patience, and humility, and gentleness. Wow. 
I think that's something that we have to sit in for a moment and think about. That what, what effect has the gospel had on me? And how am I living in response to the gospel in my life? So Paul says all of that to us, and then he changes thoughts for a moment, as Paul well does in most of his epistles. And he says, let me talk to you about something else in verse 7, because I want to talk to you about the result of Christ living in you as you relate to the church and the world. And here's what he says in verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, and what he's about to do is to give a very loose quote from the book of Psalm 68 is what he's going to do. So he's Paul, so he can kind of give a loose quote, okay? You know, and if you have a problem with that, when you see him, take it up with him, okay? So don't take it up with me. But what he does, he gives a very loose quote from the book of Psalm 60. And he says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, let me tell you what this is. If you go back and read Psalm 68 at some point today, you know, that it is an Old Testament reference to that of Christ's resurrection and that he would place his spirit in people and that he would give gifts to people. Then in verse 9 and 10, they're in brackets. What does that mean? That means that they do not appear in the original translation of this text, but placed there by the translators for understanding for you and I. So it's not to be discarded, but if you are curious, that's why it finds itself in brackets. And it says in verse 9, in saying, he ascended... What does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? And we know it's a reference to the book of 1 Peter there, but let me keep on reading. He who descended into the one who also is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might feel all things. God works in the church through gifts residing in us. See, now you maybe understand why I cannot touch on everything in these 16 verses. There's so much here. We're only at verse 10. We got six more verses to go. So hang on for a moment. But what I, what I want you to hear today is that God works in the church through gifts residing in us. He says right here in these verses, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So what Paul is referring to here is God's saving grace by grace alone. One of the solaces, yes, absolutely, by grace alone, for his glory alone, no doubt. But that subsequent grace that is given to you and I, that he gives us gifts for the work of ministry is what God does. And he's given to each one of us. In a moment, he's going to give you four ministry leadership Gifts is what he's going to talk about. And I don't have time to talk about each one of those individually. But he talks about apostles, and he talks about prophets, and he talks about evangelists, and he talks about the office of the pastor teacher. And you say, but Mark, I don't fall into any of those, right? I, I don't. So this is not me. I'm going to turn this off because I definitely don't want what you do. So I'm going to turn all this off. No, no, you're going to miss the point. Because Paul's point is that we're all uniquely, every one of us in this room, gifted by God for the purpose of strengthening the body. Every one of us in this room, every one of us, that God speaks uniquely. God reveals himself uniquely through each of us in this room. You reveal Jesus in a way that I can't. That's how he puts the body together. That's how he gifts every one of us, that you reveal Jesus in a way that I can't. The scripture says that he descended and ascended, that he might fill all things. And I want to kind of spend a moment here with you this morning 
that this is the whole point of the work of God in our lives. Understand that this is the whole point of the work of redemption, that God did not send his son to save you and I just to rescue us from going to hell and make sure that our ticket to heaven was validated. It's more than that. It was to fill you with himself. Understand that that he redeemed you so that he would fill you with himself, that you might be filled with all things, the writer says, so that you experience him, not in just him working for you through the gospel, that you experience him working through you. That the gospel does not terminate within itself. That there's a reason that God redeemed you. He redeemed you to work through you, every one of us. Well, Mark, I don't find myself in those four categories of leadership that Paul talks about right here in Ephesians chapter 4. Can I tell you, it's not put there to be just this exhaustive list, and there's nothing beyond that. Don't miss Paul's point. Read all of this in context. The point is that God ultimately wants to work through all of you through gifts that he gives you by grace is what he's saying our benediction that we pray every sunday morning ephesians 3 verse 20 now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us according to the power that we're within us to him be glory in the church it's the power that works in us Understand that. God's desire has always been to fill you so that he can work through you. Not just rescue you from hell. Now, some of you, oh, I know you, right? I, you're hung up on this, and he had also descended in the lower regions. You're hung up on that. You say, Mark, you got to talk about that for a moment. And no, I don't have to talk about that for a moment. But I will tell you, if you want to understand some of that, later on, jot this down in your notes, 1 Peter 3, 19 and 4 and 6. Go back, read those, kind of mull those over, do some reading, reach out to me if you have some discussion about it. It's about that of Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison, that of that work of in Hades after after the cross, but that's not what necessarily Paul is talking about here. He's referring to Christ coming to this world, descending in the incarnation, that of the resurrection, him ascending. Why does all of this happen? So that he might feel all things and work through you and I. Wow. That's a lot. Man. That's a lot to digest for us this morning. It is. But I want to say to you about that of God filling you and working through you. It is God's will. And that's what Paul is establishing. And maybe you have doubt about how God would work through you or if God even desires to work for, through you. And I want to tell you, if you are a believer this morning and a follower of Christ, it is God's will. It is his desire to fill you and to flow through you. So if you have, if that's the only thing that you hear, hear those words. Verse 11 and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers, which is me, to equip the saints, which is you, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. See, you have a place. God filled you to flow through you until we all obtain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature man. This is how you grow up in God to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by the every wind of doctrine, as children are, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. I think we become so intrigued by the question of what is my gift? And I would never devalue a search in discovering 
God's gift in your life and how God works through you. So don't read that into what I'm about to say, but I think we become so intrigued in what is my gift and identifying that gift that we have lost the ultimate concern of being a gift. And that's what Paul is saying. It's my response to the gospel. It's how I live my life is what he's saying. Wow. Then I become so intrigued with this discovery, which we should be in a discovery mode about the gifts that God uses in our life, that we fail to be a gift and how the Spirit functions through us as these these ways in which Paul gave us to walk out our life in response to the gospel, in humility and gentleness and patience and bearing one another in love and loving unity above controversy and maintaining unity based on the gospel. Wow. I would give you a word of advice. And that is, before you begin this overwhelming search and all-encompassing search for your gift, and I think you should, ask yourself, am I walking in humility? Am I living in gentleness? Am I patient? Am I bearing my brother and sister up in love? Am I loving unity above controversy? Am I maintaining unity based on the power of the gospel in my life? And I suggest that you begin to work on that first. Because what Paul gives us here is not an exhaustive or an exclusive and or excluding list for you and I. And I made a little list for you this morning. It's in your notes. If you don't have notes, grab them on your way out because there's some text for you to follow up with. But what I realize in the church, there is a powerful gift of the gospel, the charisma. It's that gift of favor that we live in. There is the gift of the Holy Spirit at salvation, that when you come to God, that you as a vessel are filled with the presence and the power of God, the Holy Spirit. There is even the gift of our station in life. If you read 1 Corinthians 7 and 7, Paul even says that for him, celibacy is a gift. You know, I don't know if you're praying for that one or not, right? But, but he even mentions that, that that's, that's a gift as well. Marriage is a gift. There's the gift of ministry in Ephesians chapter 3. There is the gift of people to the church in Ephesians chapter 4 that we're talking about as well. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 28, there are the gifts known as the spiritual gifts, the charismata. You see, Paul's point, and don't miss it, is that God has filled you to work through you. Every one of us in this room. So, if your search is for a loophole as a believer... To somehow get away from that, can I tell you that God is greater than the IRS? Did you know that? There are no loopholes. There are none. It doesn't exist. That you are all a gift to the church, and God has redeemed you to work uniquely through you. Let me say something about spiritual gifts for a moment. 
that they are an experience or an ability God gives you to build up others. Understand why God gives us gifts. They're to manifest Jesus. What gifts do as working through our life, they make the invisible visible to other people is what gifts do. You say, Mark, do I, I have talents? Is talents the same thing as a gift? And I would tell you this. If God is using your talent to manifest himself to others, then I would say yes, but not always. Talents are things that you are born with. Gifts are things that you receive when you're born again. But Mark, your talent is public speaking. Can I tell you, that is not my talent at all. It's not. You're looking at the guy that when he would walk down the street and he saw somebody he knew, he would find a reason to cross the street to the other side so he wouldn't have to speak to them, not because he thought that somehow he was better, but yet because he was so shy. Because what this is in my life, as inadequate as I may be at times, is a gift from God. But Paul makes a point for you and I. And that point is that we're all a gift to the body. And God's desire has always been to fill us so he would work through us. Look at these last verses. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. He says that I'm to grow up in Christ. And and I, and I thought that's a very odd way to say that, to grow up into Christ. It doesn't mean that I grow up to be Christ. But what it means is this. It's a direction of my growth and my maturity. So what he's saying to me is that as I grow in in my relationship with God, that I never grow out of my dependency upon God. See, it's very different than how we raise our children. We raise our children to be independent of us, hopefully at some point, right? But God, through our maturity in him, the more we mature in God, the more dependent we become on him. So what this passage does, it brings us to a point, perhaps, for you and I in our Christianity today, to have a, one writer said, a new reformation in our Christianity. Why? Because as sure as that of indulgences were sold prior to Martin Luther and the Reformation, then what we have done is we have strayed from the gospel. Because if we truly found ourselves immersed in the gospel, then these things of patience and love and all of these other things that Paul lists for you and I would be evident in our life. So we've strayed from the gospel. We have made non-essentials essentials in our relationship with God. We have embraced individualism 
And we have forgotten that we walk this out as a body of Christ. We have put great trust in ecclesiastical hierarchies. And we have lifted men sometimes even to be equal with God. And Paul says, come back. I want you to come back for a moment. That you are called to be stewards of this grace and mercy in humility and gentleness and patience and bearing one another in love. That you find your strength daily to live that kind of life through the gospel. And in understanding the gospel, I understand that I'm redeemed to be filled with God, and I'm filled with God so that God will flow through me. Wow. 47 minutes, 58 seconds, 16 verses. And I could go three more weeks, right? I would encourage you to take these 16 verses. This afternoon, I know it's beautiful outside. The sun is shining. Words of faith, right? No, that's more like lying, isn't it, really? Yeah. And, 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 but you're locked in the house this afternoon. I hate to tell you, it's going to rain all day, okay? So this is the deal. Just get out of your system. You know, I know you lost an hour of sleep. So maybe take a little snoozola or, or a moment, you know. Um, you say, Mark, you have forgotten that I have children. I know I have, right? For some reason, I forgot that. I don't know why. Yeah. And take these 16 verses and read through them. And before you open any commentary or do anything, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where you are in these 16 verses. Deal with the hard reality that if you are not living a life that's marked by humility and patience, long-suffering, bearing one another in love, if those things are not evident, not perfect, I understand, because you got an imperfect guy up here talking to you, right? So not perfect, but if those are not visible markers in your life, then I would suggest for you to close chapter four, go back to the first three chapters and read them again and reintroduce yourself to the gospel and what God has done for you. And that will empower you to live a life worthy of the call. So for all of you that have ever had the thought, God cannot use me or God does not want to use me or I'm incapable of God working through me or using me, can I tell you? When you get to the car, after you run through the rain, open the passenger side door. Now, if your wife's sitting next to you, don't say this because they might think you're talking to them and tell the devil to get out of the car and take the lie with him, okay? All right? Now, if she's sitting there or he's sitting there, then make sure they understand what you're doing because that may cause some problems and you have to call me next week for a meeting. But yet, you know, and tell him to take that lie with him because it's a lie. So for a moment, can I pray with you? So if you take a posture of prayer, those of you in the room, those who are joining us online this morning, and let me pray for you and pray with you this morning for a moment. So Father, as we take all of these things that you have given us this morning from your servant Paul as you moved on him by the power of the Holy Spirit to write these things to us, that God, we would take them and digest them, that we would make them part of who we are, That, God, we would 
take a moment in the busyness of our life, God, to carve out some time with you to inventory our lives. Are these things that you spoke through, Paul, evident within our life? Are we walking a walk worthy of the call, the gospel? And Father, if we are not, then reintroduce us to what you have done in our lives, Lord. And from that, God, help us in embracing the truth that you saved us from more than just to escape hell, but Lord, you redeemed us to fill us and to work through us. And Lord, before we begin to take a survey for our gifts or any of those kinds of things that are very helpful, God, that we would look at our lives and make sure that we are being a gift first. Because, Lord, we must love each other well in this room first before we can love others outside this room. So convict us by the Holy Spirit. Draw us to a place of repentance this morning in confession. And Father, change us by your word today. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And we thank you for that in your name. Amen. Would you stand together for a moment of worship this morning before we leave, please?
Hey, thanks for joining us today and spending this time with us. Before you leave, would you take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel or go on Facebook and comment there so that more people will have the opportunity to hear this message. Also, if you'd like to further engage, go to our website at hopeandanderson.com and subscribe to our newsletter as well. We'd love to see you on campus sometime. Our services are at 9 and 11 a.m. And we would love to have you here in person. So again, thanks for your time and have a great day.